But welcome, everybody. Really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to uh, to listen to our presentation. Like Bailey said, the topic for today is how embedded resistors can revolutionize high frequency electronics. So again, I'm John Andrasakis. I'm the director of business development here at Quantec Omega Tyser. I'm a uh, industry veteran uh, with over four decades of experience in the printed circuit board industry, spending a lot of time uh, working on design, building, and uh, coming up with materials for making printed circuit boards. So today we're going to cover, you know, what is, you know, driving our modern communication networks? What are the trends? And where do embedded resistors fit into this uh, trend? We'll talk about the uh, technology of embedded resistors, uh, share some applications, and then what we have up our sleeve, what's in development, what we're working on for the future, and then how to get started with embedded resistors. Then we'll have the uh, summary and uh, questions and answers. So we all know we live in a, you know, a, a modern communication world where there's a growth of mobile technologies, not just for cell phones, but also for automobiles and, and uh, other systems. And it's driving more demand for uh, bandwidth. And with uh, 5G, millimeter wave communications, and other applications, we're really pushing the boundaries of what can be done uh, with the existing technology. And so this really requires a lot of sophisticated antennas and sensors. One of those type of antennas is an actively electronic steered array, uh, which is becoming increasingly popular for managing these high frequency and low power signals. As I think you all know that, you know, as the frequencies have gone up uh, to carry more bandwidth, you know, more data than, you know, like 5G, uh, it's much harder to uh, have those uh, signals transmit. And so we need to get more sophisticated in our uh, antenna systems. So, you know, where does embedded resistors fit into this technology? Now, the AESA technology has traditionally been used in defense applications because of its uh, accuracy and because of what it, what it can accomplish. And so, uh, but we're seeing it more now being used in commercial applications, just driven by the need of, uh, of 5G uh, you know, networks. And, you know, people are not familiar with these actively, uh, you know, steerable arrays, uh, you know, it can present some design challenges because now, as opposed to a passive array, a typical phased array, you know, the active array has a lot more electronics. And uh, because of that, uh, they need a lot more passives to go along with the active components. So you get much tighter routing, high layer counts, and limited surface area of the PCB. So as a designer, what do you do? You're, you're stuck basically having a lot of these resistors and other passive devices you have to put uh, in order to uh, accomplish the needs of these type of uh, systems. And so uh, we really need to do something to free up that board space. And so uh, that's one of the things that we can do with uh, embedded resistors. And not only do you get the, uh, the benefit of freeing up real estate, but you also get uh, improved high frequency performance, which I'll go to in a little bit. And also, you know, everyone says, oh, uh, resistors are cheap. Well, resistors for regular DC type, uh, you know, circuits or low, you know, uh, digital type circuits, yeah, they can be pennies or fractured pennies depending on the application. But we're just getting into the, the very demanding requirements of high frequency resistors. Now we're going from pennies to possibly dollars per resistor. So there could possibly also be a, a, a savings. So you can see now, you know, resistors are growing and, and the passive devices are taking up much more room. So... Uh, that's why we're looking at the technology of embedded resistors. So uh, I mentioned that you save in real estate. So if you could take all those resistors off the surface of the board and put them down inside the board, you get that area savings. But what about performance? Well, here's an example where we took uh, your typical 0402 surface mount resistor. And, you know, it's not just the resistor we're worried about. Uh, we also have to worry about the vias and also the connections, which is typically a solder joint. And so uh, by doing, you know, you look at the total of, you know, you can get a really good SMT resistor, but by the time you put the vias and the traces and the, and the solder all in place, you can start driving up your, uh, uh, your equivalent series uh, inductance and also your capacitance. And so you can really, if you look at this particular uh, application, you know, your total could be, um, you know, 6.29 nanohenries. Uh, but if you go down now and you look at the uh, embedded resistor, now you've eliminated the uh, vias, the solder joints, and now the resistor is in plane with the conductor. And so you can see that we can get an order of magnitude 
reduction in the inductive reactance. And like most things when it comes to uh, frequency performance, as the frequencies get higher, this difference just gets much bigger. And so uh, you can see that when we, by the time we're just up to five gigahertz, we're already seeing that um, a major uh, reduction in the inductive reactance, which really helps with electrical performance. So here's a depiction of what we're talking about with embedded resistors. You know, they're basically thin layers of non-magnetic resistive materials and the deposit on copper foil, typically by sputtering or plating. And the use that's nice about this, it utilizes existing printed circuit board uh, technology. So there's really not a, a major investment in order to implement this uh, technology at the PCB shop. Um, we would test the, uh, we need to test the inner layers uh, electrically as well as bare boards to make sure that the resistors are, are meet requirements uh, and that they meet, you know, the values as well as they, they're intact. And so if you could peel back the layer of, uh, of a circuit board, you'd see the resistor layer underneath and those those little gray uh, rectangles and, uh, and squares kind of depict what a typical and better resistor would look like. So getting a little bit more into the technology of the, of the embedded resistor, how, how it's made, uh, uh, there used to be two companies, you know, Omega Technologies and Tyser Technologies, and they were brought together under what we call Quantic Electronics Umbrella back in 2021. So now both technologies are available from us, uh, uh, you know, uh, Quantic uh, Omega Tyser. And so they're made in a wide web roll-to-roll -roll format. And so they're very conducive to volume manufacturing. The uh, thin metal alloy uh, copper foil combination is, we like to refer to as RCM, which is resistor conductor material. So when you buy the material, you're getting both the resistor you know, onto the conductive copper. And it's uh, basically laminated to any dielectric material of your choice, just like traditional copper foil. And then it's subtractively processed to, re re to basically produce the copper circuitry and the planar resistors. The uh, difference between the two is that the Omega Ply RCM is actually electrodeposited non-magnetic nickel phosphorus. And uh, it's uh, the copper foil supply is out of Denkai America, which is in Camden, South Carolina. It's the, uh, used to be known as the Oak Mitsui uh, plant. Uh, so that our uh, majority of our copper foil is domestic, domestically supplied. But we do have some developmental foils out of Denkai Japan, Circa Foils Luxembourg and Mitsui out of Japan. And so we are always looking at alternative uh, copper sources depending on our needs. The uh, copper, a uh, direct customer is typically the, the uh, copper clad laminate supplier. So it'll be your Rogers, your ADC, Isola, and others. So uh, it's basically whatever material the customer requires, we would then sell to the, the, the laminators. And then uh, we have a 21,000 square foot facility in Culver City, California, which is not that far from LAX. Uh, our other facility, another company, is the Tyser, and that has a proprietary sputtered non-magnetic nickel chrome. We also have uh, nickel chrome aluminum silicate and chrome silicon oxide. And these two other alloys have higher resistivity so that uh, we can make higher resistance values. But 90, over 90% of what we produce is the nickel chrome. The, uh, again, copper foil supply is very similar. We have Denkai America as the largest supplier, but we also get a low profile copper foil out of Taiwan copper foil. Um, again, we're working with the same uh, development projects on copper foils from Japan, Luxembourg, and, and, uh, uh, and also from Mitsui, Japan. And then we're also work with the major C same CCL laminators, except in some cases we've had, you know, Panasonic and DuPont has been doing work with Tyser for a long time. And so some customers prefer um, that material on those particular substrates. But again, we can supply pretty much any material on any substrate. We have a 14,000 square foot manufacturing space that's split between our Windsor, Connecticut facility where the sputtering occurs. And then our finishing operation is in Chandler, Arizona in the Phoenix area. So uh, to get into the process, it basically is like I said, traditional printed circuit board process. We start with the inner layer, like an inner layer core, and we put the photoresist on, we expose it, the pattern, we develop, and then we go ahead and we etch the uh, copper uh, that we, where we don't want it. So uh, basically we're still protecting both resistor and copper at this point. Now, in the case of Omega, there's still a residual resistor layer that has to be removed because the cupric chloride doesn't completely remove all the resistor material. So we go through a copper sulfate bath, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and uh, all the background um, resistor material is, is removed. 
In the case of the Tyson material, it's so thin and it's a nickel chrome that the copper, the copper sulfate tip, I mean the copper chloride typically takes all of the background resistor material away. So you can you can skip that additional step. Then after the resistor material, the background resistor material is removed, we strip the photoresist and we start the process again. Put the photoresist down, but now when we expose it, we open up the window where we want the resistor to be. Okay, and then we'll go through an alkaline etch. And that's the beauty of this system is the alkaline etch, which is typically your outer layer etching solution for most circuit board shops, will remove the copper selectively, but not touch the resistor material. And so once that's done, we will strip off the photoresist. And now we have the um, resistors exposed and our patterns are done. And then you would go your traditional circuit board processing. You know, first you do your electrical test. Then you would do your oxide process or oxide alternative, and then go into your lamination process and, and go from there. So be from that point on, it's like a traditional circuit board operation. So what do we mean by ohms per square? Okay, ohms per square what? Well, it's a sheet resistivity and it's a dimensionless uh, unit. And so basically is if you have a square of material, like this example would be you know, 25 ohms per square, what would happen is, is that whether it's one millimeter by one millimeter or one kilometer by one kilometer, it still would be 25 ohms, okay? The only difference would be in the power handling capability. The way you make resistors with this is that it's basically the, uh, the ratio of the length to width. And so example here is if you have a 25 ohm, uh, ohm per square material, if the length is twice the width, you're going to get a 50 ohm resistor. Uh, and if it was four times, you get a 100 ohm resistor. So by controlling the length to width, and you, once for a sheet resistivity is picked, you can make different size resistors. And we have an example of that on the right side. So with a 100 ohm material, we were able to make everything from a 50 ohm, which now the width is twice the length, to up to uh, you know 100, you know, to uh, up to a 10,000 ohm. And that's uh, you know uh, quite a range of resistors. That's why most people typically only need one layer of this material inside their circuit board um, to, to do what they're required to do. And you could see here um, that it's a kind of a serpentine pattern to make these very high resistor values. So uh, it takes up very little area. You can make a, a large resistor by just serpentining it. Now, one thing we like to guide people is, is to try to make the largest resistor that they have room for, because smaller resistors will have higher tolerancing because of the fact that the etch factor that the board shops can hold maybe you know good most board shops can hold plus or minus 12 and a half microns you know half a mil and so um uh is you know again as it gets smaller resistors get smaller that etching tolerance will have a bigger impact so again you try to make it as big as possible it also have help with uh, power handling as well we have cheap resistance values between 10 and a thousand ohms per square and the way that's controlled is by the alloy and also by the thickness so the uh, nickel phosphorus is the um, is the thicker material, and it can go to the 10 ohms. Uh, and uh, the, um, the the chrome silicon oxide is the uh, is the material we use for the 1,000 ohm. Uh, most of our customers will find that working in the 25, 50, and 100 ohm per square is uh, is this kind of a sweet spot where a lot of designs uh, seem to fit in. So we talked about applications now. I mentioned the ASEA radar and any other type of phased array. I'm using this kind of as a proxy for uh, high frequency uh, electronics. But the uh, you know the, the we have a long history of this uh, of our RCM material in RF and microwave circuits uh, operating up to 550 gigahertz and beyond. And most of them have been used by uh, major defense OEMs. Uh, and again, they've been doing it for a long time. And what's nice about that is that you know you know anybody who's worked with defense they really put materials um, you know through the through the paces they check reliability they check you know everything uh, to make sure that it meets there and they're usually very demanding applications they could be space they could be uh, avionics they can be in a lot of different things that are under harsh environments and so they by by having the military as a major account it's really uh, made you know gives confidence in the material and also um, the material is very stable over frequency, time, and temperature. You know, we've tested it from minus 55 to 125 degrees C. And, and typically the temperature coefficient of resistance is, is less than, you know, typically less than a couple hundred parts per million. So it really doesn't vary much over the typical normal operating uh, range of temperatures. And as I mentioned earlier, reduce the parasitic inductance and capacitance. 
You have, you know, now total fewer solder joints. Again, if you're going to be putting something and something that's moving or anything that uh, is going to have any sort of vibration, you know, uh, solder joints uh, are always typically a, a concern. And so, uh, again, we can get rid of them as well as the associated vias, which allow you, again, to get better uh, packaging density and better uh, smaller form factor. So you can take up less room with your electronics. In the pictures below, you could see, you know, we have, you know, on the left side, we have a satellite application. On the right side, we got that uh, phased array antenna. Uh, but in the middle, we got three examples that customers have shared with us of their uh, like power dividers, uh, which is a very typical application for these type of electronics. So um, again, you if you didn't have our material in or you know, in this uh, application, you would now have to solder a resistor over each one of those gaps in order for the power divider to work. And so again, you, you're, you're basically now taking something that could be planar in our case and putting a three-dimensional uh, device on top of it. No matter how small it is, it's still gonna be three-dimensional. So now if you wanna bury it inside the circuit board, uh, you'd have to go ahead and build a cavity into your prepreg and uh, and and basically laminate that thing in, which which could cause some problems. And so it's a much more elegant uh, solution, uh, especially for these uh, type of devices. And this is where we see um, a continuing. It has been used for years, and a continuing interest. And as frequencies are getting higher, there's there's more and more demand for these type of applications. Another thing too in uh, the communications world is, uh, is that uh, the material also can is also a absorber of electromagnetic uh, radiation. And so it's been used in R cards, you know, high impedance surfaces and frequency selective surfaces. Uh, an example here is from uh, Toyon. They were, we were, they were, we were glad they shared this with us. And it shows that by putting the R cards in there, uh, they were able to cut out the uh, interference and the noise uh, outside of the frequency band they were interested in. And you could see that the uh, had a, a really positive effect on the uh, E-plane of the side lobes without really having any impact on the H-plane. So they got much better you know, signal, noise to ratio, signal to noise ratio and much better performance at putting the R cards in. And what's nice is by, by patterning the uh, R card or your absorber, you can basically go ahead and, and tune what frequencies you want to reject, which ones you want to pass through. And uh, again, it's a very uh, nice solution for these type of applications. Now, somewhat related to high speed and high frequency is the fact that you know electronics is getting faster. And so we want to have the passive devices as close to the active devices as possible. And so we're now seeing applications where people would want to use, they're using our material as like termination resistors. And so you can look at these packages such as interposers, probe cards, or, or substrate-like uh, PCBs, and you can now take that, you know, the resistors are small, but the vias uh, still take up space. And so if you can get rid of that, you can have, again, that improved electrical performance, get rid of the vias and the solder joints, and it can also be used on rigid flex as well as rigid applications. What's nice about this material is you can use it uh, as a flexible substrate, and we have a lot of reliability data saying that it, it will withstand, uh, you know, multiple flexures uh, over time. Um, and again, you can now place your resistors um, wherever you have space. So you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, about via placement. You can just put it inside uh, your package wherever it needs to be. And again, signal integrity, especially as frequencies goes up, this is a very low data rate. It's only one, one gigabit per second. And yet you can still see the improved um, eye diagram, uh, the signal integrity improvement. Uh, this was courtesy of applied laser technology. And again, it gets, it's because you're getting rid of that whole loop of getting up, you know, through the solder joint to the resistor back down. And so uh, you get much better electrical performance. So uh, not only is it good for high frequency, it's also, I mean, it's also good for um, high data rate for high uh, you know, speed. The other place is that um, where we see a lot of uh, use of this material is for um, the most advanced uh, smartphones. And what's in those smartphones, these MEMS microphones, uh, many years ago, we started switching from uh, ECM or the, or the condenser mics to these MEMS microphones. And so the MEMS microphones consist of a silicon uh, oscillator. It basically takes the, uh, the vibrational energy, and then it gets converted with an ASIC into the electrical energy, and then uh, it goes and provides the output. Well, what happens is because of all of the 
various frequencies that cell phones have to deal with. You have Bluetooth, you have um, your Wi-Fi, uh, 3G not so much anymore, but you have 4G and 5G. All this thing is going on uh, inside the cell phone. So you have to make sure that there's not, that the mic doesn't cause interference with those signals and vice versa. And by putting an RC filter inside this package, you can basically uh, help eliminate that and get much better uh, you know, uh, you know, better signal uh, integrity and and much uh, much better uh, output from the microphone. And the RC filter is accomplished by using our material, the resistor material, and also using um, an embedded capacitor material from my old company, uh, uh, Faradflex. Uh, so the combination of the two uh, makes for a really excellent RC filter that sits right in the package underneath the um, the MEMS and the ASIC. And so the only thing in that cavity now is just those two devices and no passes are required. And we see um, that this should be a technology that we see growing in other types of, of MEMS devices for the same type of reason of miniaturization electrical performance. One thing just as a side note is because we're talking about things that could be up in space or on other planets uh, and you know uh, they've been used successfully as heater circuits. I tell Peter, people our material can be used as a resistor, a heater, and if you give it too much power, it can be a fuse. So uh, hopefully most people won't try to push it to that point. But the heaters are uh, a very, uh, very good uh, application of this material because they are usually smaller and need less power. Than if you just simply thin down a, a copper coil, you know, using copper traces and make them thin to heat up. Uh, you can also avoid the use of some exotic resistor foils like uh, Cooper Nickel and others that are a little bit harder to process and could cause processing issues in the PCB shop. So since they already are using our material for resistors, it's basically a, a form of resistor uh, that they can do. And it can be, again, both in rigid and flex applications. A uh, couple of examples here. One is the, uh, the old um, uh, Beagle 2 um, uh, rover that was on Mars, and they needed a heater circuit for their X-ray spectrometer. And uh, it actually was able to heat it up to at least minus 50 degrees Celsius so we could work. You know, in electronics, we almost seem to be worrying about getting rid of heat. Well, in some cases, like these hostile environments, you have to apply heat. So on other planets up in space, when things get cold, you need to have a heater source. And our material is an excellent source of that. Uh, here on Earth, Earth, we're seeing a lot of it in the, the biomedical area. Here's an example of a heater uh, um, that needed to go to 60 degrees C uh, for a, a DNA sequencing uh, uh, piece of equipment. And the PCB, you know, layer two of a four layer PCB was the heater. And it was designed for 50 ohm, 10 watt, 12 volt. And it did an excellent job uh, with our 10 ohms per square, which is our thickest omega material, did an excellent job as a heater. And we're seeing more and more uh, medical applications of that. So as we talk about high frequency, anybody who's been dealing with both high speed and high frequency in our industry knows that the copper foils become under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, the uh, laminate suppliers have done an excellent job working on various resin systems to improve the dielectric loss and the uh, improve the dielectric constant. But as you start getting into higher frequencies, especially as you start going over 20 gigahertz, the copper foil makes a, a, an impact as well, and so a major impact. And so we've been working on improving the roughness of the copper foils that we offer uh, to our customers. Now we get the copper foil from the major manufacturers and we put our resistive material, which is so thin that it really doesn't change the topography of the copper foil. So whatever copper foil roughness we get pretty much goes on to um, the laminate customer with the same type of roughness. So uh, when we started out Omega Ply, the uh, PT copper was very typical. It's still used a lot today, especially on things that are not operating at high frequency or maybe hard to bond to, but it's a roughness of 6.4. So it's kind of a traditional, you know, printed circuit board copper foil that's been used for decades. Um, but there was a need for lower profile and that's when we came up with the TOC and that is a lower profile yet. And that's available for, on Omega Ply and the uh, TCR from uh, the TCR Tyser material. And that one's a little bit better performance. And then um, it turns out that um, the Tyser people had worked on the uh, EHF, which is the very low profile copper that comes from uh, Taiwan copper foils. But even that, um, we think that it's, it's an excellent product, but even that we want to push further uh, because people are asking us for these really high frequencies. And so now we're working on a product called EPS, which is out of Denkai, Japan. And you can see now we're getting below one micron RZ. 
and that is uh, currently in development. And so it was really designed uh, originally for flex substrates, but it's now uh, being used uh, for rigid as well. And so uh, Rogers has a lot of experience with high frequency performance. And so, uh, and they've been a good partner of ours for years. And so now we're, um, we've been working with them on evaluating this foil. And when we, we want to check the performance of copper foils, we like to use um, an LCP product because that one is one of the lowest uh, loss types of materials on the market. And so that way we can kind of take out the impact of the dielectric and have it more concentrated on the copper foil. So we used a four mil LCP and you could see here, so we took the raw EPS foil. That was the foil as delivered from Denkai. We didn't put a resistor on it and that's our control. And then we put both our 25 and 50 ohm material on it. This is the uh, Omega ply. And then we um, also compared it against the standard copper that is used for this material which is typically a rolled annealed. And then we also compared it to our TOC grade. And as you can see, in this case, the higher the, um, the line is on the chart, the better it is, it's less lossy. And so the raw EPS had really good loss characteristics, less than or close to about 0.9 decibels per inch uh, at 40 gigahertz. Um, and then adding the resistor layers only incrementally uh, change the res the uh, overall loss performance, which is what you expect. The resistors are a little bit more lossy than than copper foil, but it wasn't uh, a pronounced difference. Uh, I, in fact, the the biggest difference is really the copper roughness, and so uh, you know that's that's the main driver of the loss is the actual copper roughness, and not necessarily the uh, the addition of the resistor layer. We did some uh, resistance measurements. You know, of course, ver there are various PTFE substrates. And uh, we did see a, a slight increase over FR4, which is very typical because of the higher temperature to laminate them. Uh, but the peel strengths were very good. And these, uh, we didn't get as good of a peel strength on the flex. Some recent data says we're getting about two pounds peel and we're still working on that. And so when it comes to being on um, thermal set materials, I mean, thermoplastic materials like PTFE, um, we feel really good about the product. The issue is a lot of people want to use it on thermosets. Uh, that are based on PPE, PPO. And so those are notoriously hard to bond to. So what we're working on now is bond promoters so that we can now utilize this foil on other substrates. And we're working with uh, some laminators uh, on that. So how do you get started? Um, you know, basically, when you look at your, your layout, your schematic, you should be able to pick out which resistors that you really want to uh, embed. These could be due to where they're placed, you know, uh, um, uh, what their values are. And so um, so we, so we, you go look at your net list. You say, okay, these are the resistors I want to bury. And then you would, you pick your, um, your dielectric uh, based on your requirements. And, uh, and then you'd look at the foil offerings. Now, the uh, resistor select, before one thing, resistor selection, you should really look at the tolerancing that you want. If you really need a very tight tolerance resistor, then uh, this technology will, will not give a plus or minus 1%. It's typically more in the 15, 20%. But the, uh, it turns out in reality, just because you can buy a plus or minus 1% resistor doesn't mean you need it. Uh, and, that's, uh, that's, and so that uh, if you really do need it for electrical, you do all your simulations, and it says you need a plus or minus 1%, then you use a traditional surface mount. But if you, need, um, but if you don't need that, uh, we think that the gains you get by getting rid of all that uh, reductive uh, uh, reactants, inductive reactants, and other types of uh, you know frequency response, you'll be better off still burying the uh, the resistor. And you pick the foil; it'd be the mega ply or the Teicher, depending on um, what you put, you know, what resistor value you need or what printed circuit board shop you're going to, and which one they prefer. And um, and then we have a list of simulation parameters that we give out to people, so you can do your modeling. Uh, most people these days will simulate their circuits. Uh, way before building them. It's expensive to build and rebuild. So uh, we help with the simulation uh, of uh, the performance you're going to get using the material. And then things to consider is that um, there are ohmic value shifts. And that typically occurs when you're dealing with the high temperature laminates like PTFE or, or flex polyimid, where the lamination temperatures are very high. So you'll get typically a characteristic shift. The um, omega ply is a little bit more sens sensitive to that than the than the Tysha because of the nature of the material. But the nice thing about it is it's predictable and it's repeatable. So an example is if you have a 50 ohm material and it's going on PTFE, uh, it might go to 55 to 60, but it'll always be the same. So that when you're designing your artwork, 
you'll now can design your artwork, assuming that you're going to get a 55 or a 60 ohm uh, resistor to help you with uh, with centering the uh, the, the uh, distribution of your resistors. Um, the PCB process contribution, most pro again, most of these people who deal with this on a regular basis know exactly how to process it to avoid any sort of processing issues. Um, so there really isn't usually a lot. The, the biggest contribution you're going to get from the board shop is the tolerances, both for the uh, etching tolerance as well as registration tolerance. Because if the registration is improper, you could get the resistors offset from the conductors and you can actually get a total different resistance value. So it's important that that uh, the, resist the tolerances of the uh, fabrication process are, are put into play. Uh, also, power rating is important. Uh, we have a calculator available for both the Tyser and the Omega material where you would put in the size of resistor, the sheet resistivity, and then I'll tell you how much power you can handle for those resistors. Typically, most resistors only need to handle milliwatts type of power, and that's what typically they support. The thing is our calculators are very conservative because it's basically uh, done by testing the resistors in air as well as um, there's uh, there's only basically the double-sided laminate uh, with nothing on the back side. So you uh, really are giving it a worst case scenario and then we derate it on top of that. Normally when the resistor is buried, you have thermal mass around it, which will help absorb some of that heat. So people have typically told us, and, you know, you told me it's only going to be 100 milliwatts, but I'm, I'm running up around 400 milliwatts with no problem. So, again, it all depends on the stack up, and you can do thermal modeling to, to verify that. We have design uh, guidelines available as well so that, uh, you know, we, uh, so that, you know, you know things, to, things to consider uh, when you're laying out your circuits, how to uh, actually do laying out of the circuit. Uh, because basically you're just adding, you're not adding another layer to the board, you're just adding another artwork layer that has to be accounted for for that second etch. And that's pretty much the, the biggest part of uh, dealing with the design software. And we have a fabricator list available. We have many fabricators across the, uh, across the country and across the world that do this on a daily basis uh, from both prototype all the way up to you know, full volume production. We... Uh, Last year, we launched a new website, which combines both the Quantic Omega and the Quantic uh, Tyser brands together. Uh, it's called you know, quanticomega.com, and it has both products there. Um, we have a technical library, which has a wealth of information. You just need to register once, and then you have full access to it. So it gives more product information. It gives you those design tools I mentioned, processing information for the board shops, the, you know, in case there's any questions. Uh, we have a lot of articles there. Uh, and one thing I mentioned earlier is, is that uh, a lot of our customers use uh, our technology, but they don't always really share the information because it's kind of a, a competitive advantage, uh, or it could even be, you know, a, you know secretive based on the military type of application. And so, but academia is very good at, you know, taking our material, making it into different uh, types of uh, products and, and, and sharing the data. So we have, a, like, these are just three of the top articles in uh, how our material has been used for like, uh, you know, phased arrays and uh, type of, and, uh, you know, power dividers. And so uh, I think that these, there's at least a dozen or so more uh, just on these type of applications and other applications as well. So uh, I really recommend everyone signing up for the, uh, the library. It only takes typically, usually approval process takes less than a day to get you uh, into, the, uh, into the library. So in summary, the RCM foils have been used for decades in mission critical applications. They've been really put through the paces. Um, they've, uh, you know, we have a lot of reliability data in a lot of harsh environments. That's the beauty about being embedded because typically anything that is going to destroy our material is going to destroy the circuit board first. So, uh, so again, it's a it's a very robust solution, a very eloquent solution uh, to take care of your problems. Because I know that you know as designers. Uh, we're being asked more and more each day to 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 basically put more things in a smaller space and and done, to get things done very uh, you know very effectively with the least amount of turnaround time. Uh, also worry about EMI. So there's, there's a number of of issues that this type of technology can address uh, to make your life easier. And so um, again, it enables you know very high frequency and high speed uh, you know performance. And it is truly a blank slate. It's really uh, you can really unleash your creativity. You're not you're not uh, stuck with having to use a little rectangular features that you have to place somewhere. 
You can make all sorts of uh, very interesting designs. We've seen people make very interesting designs, you know, anywhere from, you know, you could make uh, circular resistors, you can make arc resistors. There's a whole bunch of things you can do that you couldn't do with a discrete component. And we're your partner every step of the way. Uh, so if you have a, uh, an idea for a project or if you're running into a problem, uh, always feel free to contact us. You can contact us through the website or you can call me or get hold of me directly at John Andrasakis at you know, quanticticer.com. And so uh, with that, I really like to thank everybody for your attention. And uh, one last thing I'd like to talk about is that um, we are going to be presenting a, a, a paper at the International Microwave Show uh, this June in Washington, D.C. It's the last session on Tuesday. And it's uh, we had built uh, some RF attenuators in conjunction with our sister company called X Microwave. One of the nice things of being part of the Quantic Group is that we have at least an, we have another you know dozen or so companies that deal with a lot of uh, very you know criti mission critical components, and X Microwave is one of them. And so we worked with them uh, with a, a design company. We built this attenuator, and uh, and so uh, we've tested it up to uh, 60 gigahertz and got excellent results. I wish I could share more results now. In fact, that'll be a topic of a future. Uh, presentation, but we're kind of you know, locked in that we can't talk much about it until after the IMS show by their rules. So once that IMS show is over, uh, we'll be able to share a little bit more information. But if you happen to be at IMS, please stop by our booth as well as uh, attend the uh, the presentation. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bailey for the question and answer session. We do have a couple here for you, John. First one is, uh, how many PCB shops can process the resistor foils? We have, um, to date, probably over 70 board shops across the world that can process the uh, the material. Uh, again, um, you know, we have a majority here in the U.S., but we have quite a few in Asia as well as Europe. So we typically, if a, if a customer comes to us with their approved uh, board shop list, generally we can find at least one shop that's on their list that they could they could utilize, and if not, we can you know work with them to uh, either get a shop that um, that you know that they have approved to use our material, or get them a new shop that uses our material on a regular basis and get it on their qualified list. Next question is: Can resistors be on the outer layer of the PCB? Uh, yes, I mean there are cases. You know, uh, uh, obviously there's a benefit of being on the inside, being you know additionally protected, uh, and but. Uh, it can be used on the outside. The only thing is you typically would want to protect it just like you would anything with a solder mask. So as long as it uh, has a solder mask on it, it should be fine. So, uh, but we do, you know, most people do have a tendency to use it on the inside, but there's no reason why it couldn't be used on, on the outside. It just needs additional extra care and processing during the outlayer process until the solder mask is applied. Okay. Uh, what are typical tolerances for the material and the finished resistors? Okay, the uh, typical tolerances range from about plus on the material itself about plus or minus five percent. Uh, some of the other materials uh, a little bit wider range when you know get down to the, some of the thinner materials you know may may approach plus or minus seven percent. Uh, but then it depends on the size of the resistor. So if the resistor is big enough, you know, you can pr tip, pr count on holding about plus or minus 15%. Some of the tinier resistors, you know, might start creeping up into the 20, 25%. But uh, lots of times we're seeing people hold um, with good practices, you know, somewhere in the 15 to, to 20% uh, type of numbers. Okay. Um, can anything be done to improve the tolerance? Yes. Well, you know, laser trimming is available. Uh, it is, uh, you know, basically what you would do is you would, oh, you would, you would basically, so let's say you want a 50 ohm resistor and you want it to be plus or minus 1%. Typically, in reality, you could probably hold better plus or minus 2% would even be closer. But let's say you want to get down into that range, uh, this low single, single digit tolerance. You would make your resistor, let's say, um, you know, 47 ohms. You would design it specifically to be low. And then you would go ahead and do a, uh, a laser cut into the resistor. So you'd measure it, laser cut, measure it, and then maybe I need to make another laser cut uh, to get it to your, your tolerance. It's a very time consuming process, uh, can be somewhat expensive, but uh, if, again, if you need that precision, it can be done. We have a, a couple of customers now that are looking into that because actually they want to tune their circuits. 
So it's not the matter of that they want to trim the resistor just to trim the resistor's sake, but they're actually using it to help tune a circuit. Um, and so, uh, so there are, that's an application where they're actually going to be they're going to be doing the trimming anyway. So uh, it didn't add to their overall process. But uh, again, most people find that they don't really need to get uh, you know that fine of a uh, of a tolerance for the resistors. Oh, okay, here's another one. Omega Ply and Tyser appear to occupy the same technology space. Will these products ever be rationized to only one choice? Uh, no. Um, if you look at it, yes, there's some overlap in product uh, capabilities, but there are some differences, and some people have preferences. And uh, again, the uh, in some cases, the people have preferred the um, the Omega material. They've been using it for years, and uh, it's worked well for them. In some cases, they've used the Tyser. So they 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 are complementary. They as again, when it comes to the low ohmic values like the 10 ohm, you know, we only have the omega available. When you start getting into the really high ohmic values, we only have the Tyser available. In that center spot, they do overlap, but we find that you know, people have a preference one way or the other based on either ease of processing or power handling. So we don't uh, have any plans to discontinue any product line or rationalize. We're going to be keeping you know both uh, products alive and and well. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Is there copper weight available? Or uh, is yeah. the copper weight available? Yep. Yeah, so we, um, most of our copper is half ounce copper because uh, especially with these type of applications, half ounce copper or 18 micron copper is uh, is is typically what most people want. Uh, but we can make, we have, uh, we, we have 12 micron copper and one ounce copper are, are available as well. So sometimes you may want a little more, uh, you know, copper there. So we have the one ounce. Uh, so again, um, they are available. We are working on some other alternative uh, ultra thin coppers, which I'd like to talk to at a, a later date, which is really more designed for chip packaging. So uh, in a future event, we'll be talking more about, you know, that product. But again, from a daily basis, nine half ounces seems to be always Pretty much on the shelf, and then we also about to have the one in the one ounce and the the thirty five micron and the twelve micron available as well. Great, thanks, John.